Welcome back to The Constitutional Clarion. This video is about confidence and supply agreements, and in particular, the rather peculiar confidence and supply agreement that was recently negotiated between the Jackie Glambic Network, JLN members, and the Rockliffe government in Tasmania. But first, before I get to that, a little bit about what confidence and supply agreements are and their history in Australia. Now, when there's a hung parliament, there are basically two main options. The first is the formation of a coalition government, which joins together two parties so that together they have majority support in the lower house. An example is the coalition that was formed by the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom with the Liberal Democrats back in 2010. The second option, and the more common one, is a minority government. As long as the government can survive confidence motions and get its budget bills passed so that it has the money to be able to govern, then it can sustain defeats on other matters such as bills, amendments and procedural uh, motions. Basically, it has to fight for every single vote on its merits and convince the crossbenchers uh, to vote in favour. Now, this approach can be exhausting, obviously, for members of the government if they do have to treat every single vote as one on its merits in which they have to persuade a majority of parliament to pass it. But it can also result in better government to the extent that the government is actually forced to explain and justify all its legislation. It means that a government can't be high-handed and that it needs to be measured and reasonable in what it puts to Parliament. On the other hand, however, the prospect of a government potentially falling at any time due to defeat on confidence or supply can result in economic instability and a lack of investment in the jurisdiction due to the uncertainty as who will be governing and what their policies will be tomorrow or next week. Accordingly, it has become common in Australia for the negotiation of confidence and supply agreements with those who hold the balance of power. For example, back in 1989, the Greens negotiated with Labor an agreement that they called the Accord, which dealt with both confidence and supply, but as well as that, many other policy matters. Now, this accord in the end, along with a vote of no confidence, which obviously was critical in the existing Grey government, was enough to uh, encourage the governor to appoint Labor to form a new government. Such agreements have also frequently been used by those who have their short moment in the sun, their moment of power as crossbenchers holding the balance of power, to ensure a lasting legacy of greater transparency uh, and integrity in government. So we see these types of agreements usually used to support things like freedom of information and integrity commissions and parliamentary reforms to ensure better accountability to the people. Uh, an example of that was the Charter of Reform that was negotiated by the independents with the Greiner minority government back in New South Wales in 1991. Since then, other notable agreements include the Victorian Independence Charter of 1999, Peter Lewis's Compact for Good Government with the South Australian Government in 2002, the Labor Greens Agreement in Tasmania in 2010, and at the national level, the Gillard Government's various agreements with Greens and Independents in 2010. The New South Wales Parliamentary Library has actually kept a uh, record of a number of these agreements on its website, so you can actually compare the terms and conditions of those agreements for anyone who's interested. The purpose of these agreements is threefold. First, to provide greater certainty and stability to a minority government. Second, to enhance public confidence in the legitimacy and the longevity of a minority government. And third, to influence the governor or the governor general, as the case may be, in the exercise of their power to appoint a premier or a prime minister. In Canada, confidence and supply agreements are given less weight 
than they are in Australia, although one did actually play quite an important role in the prorogation crisis back in 2008, because in that case you found um, a minority government in existence, but then disparate opposition groups and parties banded together to offer supply and confidence to an alternative government leading to that crisis about whether or not there should be a prorogation to allow the existing government to renegotiate its position. In New Zealand, due to its MMP system of proportional representation, hung parliaments and negotiation of confidence and supply agreements are actually pretty standard fare. What is the status of a supply and confidence agreement? Well, members of parliament cannot enter into legally binding contracts in relation to how they vote in parliament. And this is obviously for the very good reason uh, that members of parliament should be bound to exercise their best conscience in voting for what they believe to be in the best interests of the people that they represent in parliament. And for that reason, courts have held that any kind of contract that would bind a member of parliament in terms of how they vote is for an improper purpose and therefore legally invalid. Equally, any interference with how a member of parliament votes would also be a breach of parliamentary privilege. Accordingly, such agreements are not regarded as contracts, but instead they're regarded as political in nature. No one can go to court to seek an injunction to prevent a member from voting in a particular way on a motion of no confidence, or to seek an order to compel a member to vote in a particular way in parliament. Nor could a member of parliament be sued for damages for breaching a confidence and supply agreement by their vote in parliament. This is because they're not contracts, they're just political agreements. So confidence and supply agreements involve political commitments to act in a particular way, but those commitments can be broken in the same way as any other political commitment. The ramifications are political, not legal. Now, coming to the recent developments in Tasmania, on the 10th of April, 2024, the Tasmanian Premier, Jeremy Rockliffe, entered into a confidence and supply agreement with the three members of the Jackie Lambie Network, JLN. Later, on the 12th of April, Rockliffe also received, quote, a written assurance of confidence and supply from the independent David O'Byrne, pending a more formal agreement, which is at the time of recording this video, is still to be negotiated. This would provide good evidence to the governor that Rockliffe can command the confidence of the lower house and therefore should be reappointed as premier. None of this is particularly surprising. What is surprising, however, is the nature of the agreement negotiated by the JLN, which imposes quite serious restrictions on its members while giving them very little in terms of concrete policy change and reform. This is quite mystifying given their relative negotiation positions and strengths. So what did the JLN get in exchange for their support on matters of confidence and supply? Well, they got recognition as a non-government party for the purposes of resourcing. The government will provide the JLN with an additional four full-time equivalent staff, similar to arrangements that had previously been um, provided to the Tasmanian Greens, as well as each of the JLN members getting an office in Parliament House and being able to have a party room that they can use in the building. There are also a couple of concrete promises about responding to the Commission of Inquiry into the Tasmanian government's responses to child sexual abuse in institutional settings, such as the shutdown of the Ashley Detention Centre. But that's about it in terms of definite outcomes arising from this agreement. Beyond that, there are nebulous promises on consultation and policy. On the consultation side, the JLN get to meet with the Premier or his delegate at least once a week when Parliament is sitting to discuss bills to be introduced and once a fortnight when Parliament's not sitting. 
But the reality is that it's not going to be the, de- the Premier, is it? It's going to be a delegate uh, who does these meetings and their value will depend entirely on the willingness of both sides to make this more than a tick box exercise. JLN members are also to be permitted to put in budget bids at least three months before the budget and the government will consider them in good faith but give no commitments that they will actually be implemented. So they can ask, they can put out the begging bowl but not necessarily receive anything. On the policy front, the government has agreed to conduct some assessments and reviews, which is really a way of kicking the can down the road until people actually forget what it was all about. It will conduct an independent review of the state's finances. It will also review the Tasmanian Integrity Commission, quote, with an eye to giving it greater capability to conduct its work, which could mean anything or nothing. There will also be a review of the RTI process. Now, what's that, you ask? Well, it's another substitute acronym for Freedom of Information, which most of us know as FOI. But to make it harder for anyone to find it, we change the initials and the acronyms used. Now, I have to say New South Wales did go one step further into deliberate obscurity by calling it, instead of FOI, GIPA, standing for Government Information Public Access Act, because you can pretty well guarantee that anyone looking for a law on freedom of information is not going to look under G for government. Uh, But Tasmania also decided to uh, muddy the waters a bit there by confusing people um, by choosing instead RTI, which sounds a little bit like a nasty infection but actually means right to information. Anyway, all the JLN got was an agreement that the RTI legislation would be reviewed, quote, with an eye to increasing transparency and accountability of public administration across the state, unquote. Like a beast out of the book of Revelation in the Bible, this government will have many eyes cast in different directions, but there is a Big difference between seeing and doing, as the JLN will no doubt discover. Then we have a review of political donations legislation, which has been an ongoing issue in Tasmania and probably would have been on the government's agenda anyway. Now, in return for what could be described as a nothing burger, what are the JLN members providing the government with? Well, the answer is quite a lot. They will support the government on all confidence and censure votes by attending and voting with the government, except in cases of malfeasance and corruption. They will guarantee supply by voting to support all appropriation and revenue bills unamended. And they will support the Rockliffe Liberal government on parliamentary motions that bind the government While the first two commitments on confidence and supply are pretty standard, uh, it's the last one on parliamentary motions that bind the government, which is unusual, and it gets worse. In relation to foreshadowed parliamentary debates, if a JLN member wishes to vote against the government, they have to provide 24 hours notice in writing and then engage in good faith negotiations to reconcile their position with that of the government prior to the commencement of the debate. If a JLN member wishes to vote against the government on any vote that occurs on the fly, meaning one that spontaneously arises in the course of debate, which happens quite often, and that includes their procedural motions or amendments to bills, then they have to inform the government at the earliest possible opportunity. They then have to support the government in seeking to adjourn the debate on the question to allow those negotiations to occur. If an adjournment is not immediately practicable, the JLN member then has to vote contrary to their own views to support the government, while then being, quote, free to voice their concerns and reserve their right to vote as they wish 
in future on similar questions. Now, these limits on the JLN members are actually pretty extreme. Finally, in instances where a procedural motion is moved to allow for debate on any matter covered by this confidence and supply agreement, presumably covering all those topics in which the government agreed to reviews, etc., the JLN members are obliged to support the government. Wow! One can understand why the Rockcliffe government wanted such provisions. The election had indeed been called as a consequence of two defecting Liberal members refusing to commit to a more restrictive confidence and supply agreement. The government wanted them to agree not to support Labor, Green or other independent bills, amendments to bills or motions unless it was agreed that they could do so by the government. In rejecting this kind of agreement, Lara Alexander, one of the um, former Liberals, remarked that agreeing to it would give her less independence than a government backbencher and leave her unable, as an independent member of parliament, to represent her community. The government responded to this by calling an election. But that election card has now already been played. The election has been held and the government did not win a majority. So it's in a much weaker position as it cannot opt for another election in the short term. So why, one wonders, when the JLN members did hold the whip hand, did they surrender so much control to the government? Was it just for party treatment and a few extra staff and a party room in Parliament House? It all seems rather mysterious to me, although clearly I am not an aficionado of Tasmanian politics, so maybe there was a lot more going on that I just don't know anything about. One would have to assume so. Now, some criticism was made um, uh, on um, social media of the JLN's um, agreement uh, to this confidence and supply agreement, and they responded with a press release which said that the JLN doesn't wish to hold the government over a barrel with unreasonable demands and that its members will instead behave like adults and work in a collegiate manner with the Rockcliffe government to the benefit of all Tasmanians. Now, that is a laudable aim, but it still doesn't explain why it entered into such an extremely prescriptive confidence and supply agreement. You can act like adults and negotiate in a collegiate way without having yourself put into handcuffs. It will be very interesting to see how this all plays out, especially given that a confidence and supply agreement is not a legal contract and therefore can be broken by either side at any time it likes with only political ramifications arising. Thank you for watching The Constitutional Clarion and I look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye.